morning, Prince. But it is appropriate to ask one thing more. There still were prisoners of war who did not accept recruiting offers, who never worked for the Germans at their profession or trade, and who are not camp police, who spent the whole war in POW camps without sticking their noses outside, and who, in spite of everything, did not die, however unlikely this was. For example, they made cigarette lighters out of scrap metal, like the electric electrical engineers Nikolai Andreevich Semyonov and Fyodor Fyodor Fyodorovich Karpov, <laughs> and in that way managed to get enough to eat. And did the motherland forgive them for surrendering? No, it did not forgive them. I met both Semyonov and Karpov in the Butriki after they had already received their lawful sentence. And what was it? The alert reader already knows. Ten years of imprisonment and five muzzled. As brilliant engineers, they had rejected German offers to work at their profession. In 1941, Junior Lieutenant Semyonov had gone to the front as a volunteer. In 1942, he still didn't have a revolver. Instead, he had an empty holster and the interrogator could not understand why he hadn't shot himself with his holster. He had escaped from captivity three times. And in 1945, after he had been liberated from a concentration camp, seated atop a tank as a member of a penalty unit of tank-borne infantry, he took part in the capture of Berlin and received the Order of the Red Star. Yet after all that, he was finally imprisoned and sentenced. All of this mirrored our nemesis. Very few of the war prisoners returned across the Soviet border as free men, and if one happened to get through by accident because of the prevailing chaos, he was seized later on, even as late as 1946 or 47. Some were arrested at assembly points in Germany. Others weren't arrested openly right away, but were transported from the border in freight cars under convoy to one of the numerous identification and screening camps, PFLs, scattered throughout the country. These camps differed in no way from the common run of cor corrective labor camps, ITLs, except that their prisoners had not yet been sentenced, but would be sentenced there. All these PFLs were also attached to some kind of factory or mine or construc construction project, and the former POWs looking out on the motherland, newly restored to them through the same barbed wire through which they had seen Germany, could begin work from their first day on a 10-hour workday. Those under suspicion were questioned during their rest periods in the evenings and at night. And there were large numbers of security officers and interrogators in the PFLs for this purpose. As always, the interrogation began with the hypothesis that you were obviously guilty, and you, without going outside the barbed wire, had to prove that you were not guilty. Your only available means to this end was to rely on witnesses who were exactly the same kind of POWs as you. Obviously, they might not have turned up in your own PFL. They might, in fact, be at the other end of the country. In that case, the security officers of, say, Kemerovo, Kemerovo would send off in inquiries to the security officers of Solikomsk, Solikomsk, who would question the witnesses and send back their answers along with new inquiries, and you yourself would be questioned as a witness in some other case. True, it might take a year or two before your fate was resolved, but after all, the motherland was losing nothing in the process. You were out mining coal every day, and if one of your witnesses gave the wrong sort of testimony about you, or if none of your witnesses was alive, you had only yourself to blame, and you were sure to be entered in the documents as a traitor of and you and as a traitor of the motherland. And the visiting military court would rubber stamp your tenor. And if, despite all their twisting things about, it appeared that you really hadn't worked for the Germans, and if, and this was the main point, you had not had the chance to see the Americans in English with your own eyes, to have been liberated from captivity by them instead of by us, was a gravely aggravating circumstance. When the security officers had decided the degree of isolation in which you were to be held, certain people were ordered to change their place of residence which always breaks a person's ties with his environment and makes him more vulnerable. Others were valiantly offered the chance to go to work on the VOKHR, the Militarized Guard Service. In that situation, while nominally remaining free, a man lost all his personal freedom and was sent off to some isolated area. There was a third category, after a handshake. Some were humanely permitted to return home. 
although even without aggravating circumstances, they deserve to be shot for having surrendered. But people in this category celebrated prematurely. Even before the former prisoner arrived home, his case had reached his home district through the secret channels of state security. These people remained eternally outsiders. And with the first mass arrests, like those of 1948 and 49, they were immediately arrested for hostile propaganda or for some other reason. I was imprisoned with people in that category, too. Oh, if I had only known that was the refrain in the prison cells that spring. If I had only known that this was how I would be greeted, that they would deceive me so, that this would be my fate. Would I have really returned to my motherland? Not for anything. I would have made my way to Switzerland, to France. I would have gone across the sea, across the ocean, across three oceans. But the more thoughtful prisoners corrected them. But the more thoughtful prisoners corrected them. They had made their mistake earlier. They were stupid to have dashed off to the front lines in 1941. It takes a fool to rush off to war. Right from the start, they should have gotten themselves set up in the rear, somewhere quiet. Those who did were heroes now. And it would have been an even surer thing just to desert. Almost certainly one skin would be whole. They didn't get ten years either, but eight or seven. And they weren't excluded from any of the cushy jobs in camp. After all, a deserter was not regarded as an enemy or a traitor or a political prisoner. He was considered not a hostile factor, but a friendly one, a non-political offender, so to speak. That point of view aroused passionate argument and objections. The deserters had to spend all those years rotting in prison, and they would not be forgiven. But there would soon be an amnesty for everyone else. They would all be released. At that time, the principal advantage of being a deserter was still unknown. Those who had gotten in via 5810, snatched from their apartments or from the Red Army, often envied the rest. What the hell? For the very same money, in other words, for the same ten-year sentence, they could have seen so many interesting things, like those other fellows, who had been just about everywhere. And here we are, about to croak in camp, without ever having seen anything beyond our own stinking stairs. Incidentally, those who were in on Article 5810 could hardly conceal their triumphant pre presentiment, that they would be the first to be amnestied. The only ones who did not sigh, oh, if I had only known, because they knew very well what they were doing, and the only ones who did not expect any mercy and did not expect an amnesty were the Vlasov men. I had known about them and been perplexed about them long before our unexpected meeting on the board bunks of prison. First, there had been the leaflets, repeatedly soaked through, dried out, and lost in the high grass, uncut for the third year of the front-line strip near Orel. In December 1942, they had announced the creation of Smolensk, of a Russian committee, which apparently claimed to be some sort of Russian government and yet at the same time seemed not to be one. Evidently, the Germans themselves had not yet made up their minds. For that reason, the communique seemed to be a hoax. There was a photograph of General Vla Vlasov in the leaflets, and his biography was outlined. In the fuzzy photograph, his face looked well-fed and successful, like all our generals of the new stripe. They told me later that this wasn't so, that Vlasov's men was more like Vlasov's face was more like that of a Western general, high, thin with with horn rim, horn rimmed glasses. His biography testified to a penchant for success. He had begun in a peasant family and in nineteen thirty seven had not broken his skyrocketing career. And 1937 had not broken his skyrocketing career, nor was it ruined by his service as a military advisor to Ching Kai-shek. The first and only disaster of his earlier life had occurred when his second shock, his second shock army, after being encircled, was ineptly abandoned to die of starvation. But how much of that whole biography could be believed? From his photograph, it was impossible to believe that he was an outstanding man or that for long years he had suffered profoundly for Russia. As for the leaflets reporting the creation of the ROA, the Russian Liberation Army, not only were they written in bad Russian, but they were imbued with an alien spirit that was clearly German and, moreover, seemed little concerned with their presumed subject. Besides, and on the other hand, they contained crude boasting about the plentiful chow available and the cheery mood of the soldiers. Somehow one couldn't believe in that army, and... If it really did exist, what kind of cheery mood could it be in? Only a German could lie like that. We soon discovered that there really were Russians fighting against us, and that they fought harder than any SS men. In July 1943, for example, near Orel, a platoon of Russians in German uniform defended Sobokinsky. Sobokinsky. This 
the sulky. They fought with a desperation that might have been expected if they had built the place themselves. One of them was driven into a root cellar. They threw hand grenades in after him, and he fell silent. But they had no more than stuck their heads in than they let him have another volley of his automatic pistol. Only when they lobbed in an anti-tank grenade did they find out that within the root cellar he had another foxhole in which he had taken shelter from the infantry grenades. Just try to imagine the degree of shock, deafness, and hopelessness in which he had kept on, kept on fighting. They defended, for example, the unshakable Nyper bridgehead south of Tursk. For two weeks we continued to fight there for a mere few hundred yards. The battles were fierce in December 1943, and so was the cold. Through many long days, both we and they went through the extreme trials of winter, fighting in winter camouflage cloaks and covered that covered our overcoats and caps. Near Mali Kozlovici, I was told, an interesting encounter took place. As the soldiers dashed back and forth among the pines, things got confused, and two soldiers lay down next to one another. Next to one another, no longer very accurately orientated. They kept shooting at someone somewhere over there. Both had Soviet automatic pistols. They shared their cartridges, praised one another, and together swore at the grease freezing in their automatic pistols. Finally, their pistols stopped firing altogether, and they decided to take a break and light up. They pulled back their white hoods and at the same instant saw each other's cap, the eagle, and the star. They jumped up. Their automatic pistols still refused to fire. Grabbing them by the barrel and swinging them like clubs, they began to go at each other. This, if you will, was not politics and not the motherland, but just sheer caveman distrust. If I take pity on him, he is going to kill me. In East Prussia, a trio of captured Vlasov men was being marched along the roadside a few steps away from me. At that moment, a T-34 tank thundered down the highway. Suddenly, one of the captives twisted around and dived underneath the tank. The tank veered. The edge of its track crushed him, but the edge of its track crushed him nevertheless. The broken man lay writhing, bloody foam coming from his mouth, and one could certainly understand him. He preferred a soldier's death to being hanged in a dungeon. They had no choice. There was no other way for them to fight. They had no chance to find a way out to safeguard their lives by some more cautious mode of fighting. If pure surrender was considered unforgivable treason to the motherland, then what about those who had taken up enemy arms? Our propaganda, in all its crudity, explained their conduct as, one, treason. Was it biologically based, carried in the bloodstream, or, two, cowardice, which it certainly was not? A coward tries to find a spot where things are easy, soft, and safe. The men could be induced to enter the Wormach's Vlasov detachments only in the last extremity, only at the limit of desperation, only out of inexhaustible hatred of the Soviet regime, only with total contempt of their own safety, for they knew they would never have the faintest glimpse of mercy. When we captured them, we shot them as soon as the first intelligible Russian word came from their mouths. In Russian captivity, as in German captivity, the worst lot of all was reserved for the Russians. In general, this war revealed to us that the worst thing in the world was to be a Russian. I recall with shame an incident I observed during the liquidation, in other words, the plundering, of the Bobrusk encirclement. When I was walking along the highway among wrecked and overturned German automobiles, and a wealth of booty lay scattered everywhere, German cart horses wandered aimlessly in and out of a shallow depression where wagons and automobiles that had gotten stuck were buried in the mud, and bonfires of booty were smoking away. Then I heard a cry for help. Mr. Captain, Mr. Captain. A prisoner on foot in German breeches was crying out to me in pure, pure Russian. He was naked from the waist up, and his face, chest, shoulders, and back were all bloody, while a Sergeant Osibist, a security man, seated on a horse, drove him forward with a whip, pushing him with his horse. He kept lashing that naked back up and down with the whip, without letting him turn around, without letting him ask for help. He drove him along beating and beating him, raising new crimson welts on his skin. And this was not one of the Punic Wars, nor a war between the Greeks and the Persians. Any officer possessing any authority in any army on earth ought to have stopped that senseless torture. In any army on earth, yes, but in ours, given our fierce and uncompromising method of dividing mankind. If you were not with us, then you are not. If you are not on your own, etc., then you deserve nothing but contempt and annihilation. I was so afraid to defend the Vlasov man against the Osobist. I said nothing, and I did nothing. I passed him by as if I could not hear him. 
so that I myself would not be infected by that universally recognized plague. What if the Vlasov man was indeed some kind of supervillain, or maybe the Osibist? Would think something was wrong with me, and then? Or, putting it more simply for anyone who knows anything about the situation in the Soviet army at that time, would that Osibist have paid any attention to any to an army captain? So the Osibist continued to lash the defensive defenseless man brutally and drive him along like a beast. This picture will remain etched in my mind forever. This, after all, is almost a symbol of archipelago. It ought to be on the jacket of this book. The Vlasov men had a, pre a presentiment of all this. They knew it ahead of time, nevertheless, and the left, on the left sleeve of their German uniforms they sewed the shield of the white-blue-red edging. With the white-blue-red edging, the field of St. Andrew and the letters ROA. The inhabitants of the occupied areas held them in contempt as German hirelings. So did the Germans, because of their Russian blood. Their pitiful little newspapers were worked over with a German censor's broadsword. Greater Germany and the Fuhrer and the Vlasov men had one way out of all that, to fight to the death, and when they were not fighting, to down vodka and more vodka, foredoomed. That was their existence during all their years of war in alien lands, and there was no salvation for them from any direction. Have a good day, friends.